yeah, sorry I couldn't make it in person um, in the end, but yeah, uh, you know, at least hopefully you can you can enjoy the talk uh, this way. I hope this will be interesting to you. Um, so yeah, today I basically want to tell you a little bit more about uh, some of our most recent work on GPU code generation, which is on the Mosaic GPU, which is a DSL that we've been sort of designing for uh, yeah programming kernels primarily for Hopper and newer GPU architectures because they're quite different than what came before. Um, so just to give you a brief motivation for why we even you know got started on this, um, you know. You can imagine, I don't think this is the conference where I have to convince so many people that prepackaged libraries are not really a complete solution, right? It's great if it works, but as soon as you like deviate slightly from an operation that they have, it's a huge performance cliff, right? So we want something that can like bridge this gap somehow um, because you know we, we can't reasonably expect to always be serviced by libraries. Um, so you know, we have compilers, we have Triton, right? So what's the problem? Um, well, the problem is that, you know, especially as we've seen in the recent years, the microarchitectures change quite a bit. And compilers, as you also saw in the previous talk, they're like, they take, they take a lot of work, right? It takes a lot of time to actually adapt and develop the compiler to fully you know, take advantage of a new architecture that looks very different um, from the previous one. Um, and so, you know, then there are solutions uh, that vendors provide, like for example, Cutlass. And Cutlass is a great library, but I personally, when I write kernels, metaprogramming is one of the primary features that I actually have to use. And to me, C++ metaprogramming basically doesn't fully cut it. It's not really entirely what I'm looking for. And Triton actually, you know, uh, sorry, not Triton, Python. Um, well, Triton also, but Python actually, uh, you know, serves this purpose uh, quite a bit better. So yeah, in my opinion, we basically need a sort of better playground where we can, you know, rapidly try out sort of low level ideas, sort of see how diff what the relative performance of different operation looks like. Um, and then also, once we finally understand the microarchitecture, we might want to write at least a few sort of manual implementations, um, you know, just so that we at least understand what the target is, what kind of code we would even want to generate from a compiler. And then the final motivation for us is we actually have uh, a new sort of higher level DSL for kernel uh, writing, which is called Palace. It is actually embedded in JAX, um, but one really interesting feature about it is that it can generate both TPU and GPU kernels, for example. Um, on GPU, it uses Triton right now, but for Hopper and Onward, we're also hoping to sort of integrate some of the learnings that we have here. And so we're also trying to sort of integrate this uh, pro prototype and the CSL that I will um, show you sort of in a second um, into, into Palace. Um, yeah, so before we jump into sort of a brief example that will show you roughly how this looks like, I want to quickly talk about the current design. Um, as you probably, you know, expected from what I said uh, just a moment ago, it is integrated into JAX. It's sort of bundled with JAX, as you will see later. Um, it's heavily MLIR based. It uses a lot of MLIR tools, and it particularly reuses the sort of Python embedding. So it's a tracing DSL, which makes metaprogramming really easy, uh, which is important. It's a sort of very small... Uh, purely Python, pretty much library. It's under 4,000 lines of code, so you should be able to just sort of jump into it and hopefully, you know, get a reasonable sense and be able to, you know, navigate it and even understand what it does. Um, the core abstraction is that roughly a single warp group, so 128 threads. Um, this roughly corresponds in the hardware to a single SM on a GPU. Um, a width of threads, that corresponds to a single mosaic thread. And essentially, it provides these sort of lots of warp group level helpers uh, for, you know, dealing with arrays threaded over registers and stuff like that, and WGMMA and all that, all that um, stuff. But yeah, um, low level programming should always be accessible, as I said. Um, like, we don't expect the helpers will satisfy every single need. Um, if you want to, you can pretty much literally drop down to thread level code or even stick inline PTX into the kernel, and that is sort of fine. That is the goal, that you should be able to pretty much you know, drop down to this level if needed, but, you know, hopefully it should not be needed. Um, okay, so I just want to sort of run through a few different examples just to show you uh, how we are thinking of exposing some of the hopper features um, in this particular DSL. Um, so the way this looks like is uh, sort of the top level function you use to actually compile this is just sgpu kernel. Uh, the argument you give, it, you, you give to it is actually a function that sort of defines the body of the kernel. We'll talk about this in a second. And then just the grid shape, block shape, and sort of the specification for the shapes and D types of the inputs and outputs of the kernel. 
And then the actual kernel function, I guess this little context, we'll talk about this later. And then it just gets a splatted sort of set of references to, uh, you know, to operands and the output in global memory. Here you can see we use the sort of utility to actually load, um, you know, load from global memory into registers. Uh, and again, it is a fragmented array in that, you know, it actually partitions the array over registers according to some layout. Uh, then we add those two values and we store, um, store it into the output. As you can see, we don't just say load and store, as you might expect, for example, from Triton. And that's because there's no actual compiler. It's more of like a sort of language that actually just expands to this. You need to say what kind of layout you want to load from and what kind of layout, you know, will the, what, what kind of memory format you expect the output to be in. So it's a little bit more verbose, but you also get um, quite a bit more control thanks to this. Um, okay, but that was, you know, that was not super interesting. The grid was just a single block, so nothing really complicated was happening here. So, you know, now let's move to multi-block kernels. The grid has two blocks now. Um, not a huge thing, but, you know, this is just an example. Um, so what we need to do is, you know, here you can see sort of some of the MLIR bits poking out, um, where we actually query the sort of block ID along the X dimension and multiply it by 64. And this is quite a lot to spell out. I will, <laughs> I will, I will tell you, um, as soon as you write figure kernels, it gets a little worse, which is also partly why we're trying to integrate this into Palace, simply because a lot of the boilerplate will go away. Um, but yeah, either way, if you compute this, if you compute this um, sort of start offset, you just say, yeah, we will be slicing off from this offset always 64 elements, and then we use helpers to essentially extract, you know, the sort of subset of inputs and the output that corresponds uh, to sort of the, 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 the elements that this given block is supposed to handle. And I should say that those references are really multidimensional references in MLIR parlance, so those would be memrefs. Um, and so no pointer arithmetic would be required. You can also specify a tuple of slices that, for example, corresponds, you know, has the length up to the rank of the, um, of the reference. And, you know, there's no pointer arithmetic required. It will all be done um, for you essentially in the, in the low rank process, which helps quite a bit. Okay, we finally get to, um, you know, see some hopper features, right? This was still a basic kernel, nothing really beyond the standard um, GPU programming model. Now let's look at how TMA works. Um, so what changes here? Uh, all of the all of the arguments stayed the same. Only the last line changed, and this last argument, which previously was just an empty tuple, um, here uh, this corresponds to sort of the set of allocations in shared memory you can also request from the kernel language. So in particular, we will request three shared memory buffers, which will be sort of our targets or sources for the TMA instructions, and then barriers um, two for the inputs. Um, and then the last parameter for the kernel function corresponds exactly to the structure of those allocations. So you can see we requested three slices, so we unpack them here, and then those barriers, which you get here. And everything you have, the only thing you have to do to actually run a TMA is you just run this async copy. You specify the source and the destination references, the barrier and the slice you want to copy. We await those two copies, and then we do the copy in the, in the reverse direction. Here you can see some of the low-level bits of the sort of GPU programming model also poking out through the DSL. I think that essentially abstracting those is still a work in progress, I think, you know, both for us and for Triton. Um, and so, yeah, for now, you know, we've sort of made the pragmatic decision to pretty much expose that, for example, the copies from GMEM to SMEM and SMEM to GMEM will synchronize somewhat differently. Um, yes, uh, but, you know, this is, this is not a lot of code, right? Normally for TMA, you need to do stuff like initialize something on the host, copy it to device, like use it on the device. Here it's all abstracted just in this context async copy that sort of does the full setup for you. All right, and um, actually we can go even a step further. TMAs are actually pretty powerful abstractions. You can also sort of attach lots of different transforms. Like for example, you can sort of tile your input, which will actually be necessary for running MathMos on the GPU. In particular, here we say as we're running the async copy sort of on the fly, we will also sort of transpose and split up some of our array dimensions into 64 by 64 tiles. So if the input was 128 by 128, now those inputs will actually be, sorry, now those sort of shared memory buffers actually will reshape them. So we will reinterpret this input as being two by two by 64 by 64, right? So we will split it into four quadrants each, each one of which is 64 by 64. And we also use swizzling for performance later. 
Um, and then the next step is, yeah, actually just doing the map mall. Um, again, this is, you know, a matter of a few lines. We initialize the accumulator. We actually run the map mall. Again, we see sort of the maybe ugly bits of the GPU programming model poking out uh, for, you know, actually making sure the async map mall is complete. Of course, normally we would overlap things, you know, just like here we block immediately for memory or here we block immediately for map mall. Normally, you know, the benefit of this is you get the uh, control over what you can and, and, and can't overlap with this map mall. In this demo, of course, we don't use the asynchrony. Either way, we then, once we await the map mall, we extract the value of the accumulator and we store it to the output. And then, of course, the output is copied uh, to, the glo to global memory just as it was before. That piece of code doesn't change. And then finally, what I think is really exciting is if you want to use TMA multicast, this is actually probably the smallest change from all of the slides that we've made. Literally, the only thing you do is you say um, the cluster you know, will now uh, span both of the blocks we have. And you, to async copy, you just add a collective argument, which will say this cop sort of all of the blocks along the X dimension of the cluster will be performing the exact same copy. And so we can sort of split the responsibility of performing this copy over them and use TMA multicast to essentially share the HBM uh, bandwidth, which I think is really neat. This was like a, a pretty minimal change to the mathematical kernel, but it can, for example, uh, you know, be a huge uh, deal for performance. And so, yeah, uh, just you know, running through the small example, of course, it's a little silly in that we actually don't use the asynchrony, but you know, in, on this slide, you pretty much already have TMA, you know, warp group MMA, block clusters, and TMA multicast in, you know, something that I think can be, you know, learned and used reasonably effectively. Um, yeah, and so, you know, we have examples. Um, of course, we have a map mode kernel, uh, and also, interestingly, I think we have a sort of, uh, yeah, we have a essentially flash attention three kernel. Um, it's pretty much 200 lines of code of Python, um, like, you know, what you've seen before, including white space, so uh, not as dense as there. And uh, yeah, it performs pretty well. I, I took the shapes from the benchmark from Flash Attention 3 repository. Um, you can find the kernel itself um, at this link. And you know, it is getting up to over 70% of uh, tensor core utilization, which is you know, very close to where the official benchmarks were, which I think is a, is a pretty good success. Um, and yeah, just to, uh, just to show you one more thing, something that I, I have found personally really powerful yeah, especially as I was programming sort of a, a, an unfamiliar microarchitecture like Hopper, um, the DSL also includes sort of a warp group level profiler. So what you can see here is each line corresponds to a single warp group, and this is the flash attention three schedule. So roughly speaking, we want sort of to have two compute warp groups, and one of them computes softmax at any given time, and the other one computes the mapmos, and then they switch roles. And for example, using this warp group profiler, you can see this exactly. So warp group two in this block runs the softmax and then it waits. In the meantime, this one runs the, for example, the QK mathmo and the last one. Then they switch roles and this one runs softmax and this one does mathmos and they switch roles again. And so you can debug, you know, performance issues. You can see those things happening for yourself. You can see if your kernel is memory bound because in that case you, you would see actually like large blocks where you await for TMA results. Um, yeah, it's been it's been it's been a great addition essentially to have in your performance profiling toolbox, um, and so I, I think this is honestly one of the best features of this whole uh, of this whole system. All right, so how do you get it? Um, yeah, right now it's actually bundled by default with all Jax GPU um, uh, Jax GPU wheels. So if you just pip and so Jax, um, it will be there. I would also recommend using Jax nightly releases um, because sort of the DSL is still under active development. And so, you know, many of the features might actually not be in the in the last release um, because we're still actively working on it. And uh, yeah, can you use it with PyTorch? Yes, pretty much the only thing you change is instead of writing mGPU as GPU kernel, you just say s torch GPU kernel. And then instead of getting a back a function that, you know, takes in JAX arrays and returns JAX arrays, it will just take torch tensors on a CUDA device and returns you torch tensor and re will return you torch tensors on the CUDA device. So yeah, no, nothing changes. Uh, the same compilation stack, the code generation will be exactly the same. It will just like transparently adjust to the to the Apple framework. And it doesn't even have to initialize the GPU runtime from Jax. So you can just use it kind of as a standalone compiler. 
All right, um, so I don't have much time, so this is pretty much everything I'm able to show you right now. Uh, so just a few takeaways. Um, yeah, I think that essentially we are slowly succeeding <laughs> at making uh, sort of Hopper programming more accessible. I think you can quickly prototype them in Python now, but you know, they still remain relatively low level. You still see those like synchronization bits uh, poking out. And so yeah, for us, one of the bigger biggest next step is, steps is actually palace integration. Um, as I said, this is quite a lot to write just for A times four, which is what it will eventually look like. And yeah, that will also involve nicer abstractions for common patterns, such as, you know, as I said, synchronizations, pipelining, warp specialization. And uh, yeah, at the end, I have to leave you with a warning. This is experimental software. I do not promise stability. Uh, but if you want to play around with it, I would love it. Um, you know, sadly, I will not be around for you to ask me questions. Uh, but if you have any, I would be happy to answer them through email. Um, or you, you know, also feel free to just leave like open issues if you run into anything on the JAX repository and I'll try to answer. So yeah, thanks for your attention.